spotlighting Hawaii's leaders. We want to bring in Governor David E. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. Lieutenant Governor, good morning. Thanks so much for joining us. Mayor Derek Kawakami. Thank you so much, uh, Senator, for being here. Spotlighting the issues. Where is the virus right now in our community? How much is this overall going to cost the state? How are you responding to the community's concerns? Talk about the level of citations that you guys are writing. Spotlight Hawaii with Yanji Denise and Ryan Kalei Suji on the digital platforms of the Honolulu Star Advertiser. This episode of Spotlight Hawaii is brought to you by Long's Drugs. Aloha, thanks so much for joining us here on this Monday morning. I'm Yanji Denise, joined by Ryan Kalei Suji. This, of course, is Spotlight Hawaii on the digital platforms of the Honolulu Star Advertiser. We're so happy to have all of you logging in. Please type your questions in the comments. And we know we have a guest today that always uh, elicits a lot of questions, Ryan, and that is one coming from the Capitol. That's right. We're going to head over to the fifth floor. And joining us now is Governor David Ige. Good morning, Governor. Thanks for joining us. Uh, good morning, Ryan. Good morning, Yanji. Thanks again for giving me this opportunity. Uh, you know, we're going to start this conversation like we have so many times in the past, talking about COVID-19. Uh, of course, we continue to see uh, our numbers being pretty stable thus far, but we are seeing uh, influx of cases uh, on the mainland uh, with uh, this new variant of the Omicron. And in fact, uh, the, you know, cities like Philadelphia are going to be reinstating that indoor mask mandate. Uh, what are your thoughts as we head on into uh, this summer season? Uh, do you have any anticipation of reinstating anything like that with what we're seeing on the mainland based on counts maybe going up? Yeah, Ryan, you know, we have been very thoughtful. I know that people have criticized me for not releasing the mask mandate earlier, but I didn't want to be in that situation where we um, have the mask mandate on and off and on and off. We want it to be consistent and steady based on the data that we're seeing. Um, so we uh, did anticipate a slight increase in the number of cases due to spring break, and we have seen that in the last week or so. But we are not seeing the kind of surges that they're seeing on the mainland. So, um, you know, the hospitalized uh, hospitalizations and the numbers in the hospitals con continue to be very low here. And so we, we uh, continue to feel like we're in a good place. Um, obviously, if there is a, a big spike, we do know that masks work. Uh, and I think we see, I was over at Long's uh, over the weekend, and, and people continue to wear their masks indoors. So it's something that people know makes a difference, and people are choosing to do it. Um, so I don't anticipate uh, uh, reinstating the mask mandate at this point. Uh, you know, on the other side, there are calls for the DOE to lift the mask mandate for students in the classroom settings. When do you think it would be appropriate for that to happen? You know, Yanji, we are really focused on how we can make sure that our students are in the classrooms uh, benefiting from the in-person learning. Uh, and we know that wearing a mask for all children and teachers to wear a mask in the classroom really reduces the spread of the virus. You know, if no one was wearing a mask and a student or a teacher showed up um, sick with COVID, you know, we would have to, again, uh, look at quarantining or, or keeping those students out of classes. So, you know, wearing a mask and, and having uh, students wear a mask uh, allows us to make sure that they're in school for the maximum number of days um, through the end of the year. Uh, and especially at the high school level, you know, we would like to get uh, graduations back to normal again, uh, in person, give our uh, 2022 uh, graduates the opportunity to have a near normal graduation ceremony. You know, all of these things are part of the reasons we believe that the mass mandate uh, for the children in the schools uh, should continue in place. What is the difference you think now as the state moves forward uh, with the preparedness for, say, another variant that may come around? What are some of the differences and what is the state doing now to prepare for what experts say could be another outbreak or another form of the variant coming through? How do you think the state is better prepared now moving forward? Yeah, so thanks for that question, Ryan. You know, um, the state lab was one of the very first uh, certified in the country to be able to test for COVID. And we have consistently um, had a pretty robust surveillance system where we are testing uh, for the variants. Uh, you know, we have been uh, testing since last summer. Uh, so we see um, what percentage of the cases we're seeing the variants. 
Right now, that BA2 is about 40% of our cases. You know, uh, nationwide, it's exceeded 70% of the COVID cases. So, you know, we are below what the what they're seeing on the mainland. Um, you know, and just a couple of things I think we're, we're a lot better prepared for. You know, we did um, institute a program of uh, testing sewage. You know, that allows us to see the existence of variants um, five to 10 days earlier than we normally would. Uh, and so that program is being uh, stood up all across the state. Um, you know, we continue to expand the robust testing um, program. Uh, and of course, our lab is is sequencing uh, so that we are aware of the variants that we're seeing. So, I mean, I think on all fronts, we're in a better place. And, and you know, the at-home test capability for people to test themselves if they've, if they've uh, been exposed or they feel any of the symptoms really allows us to determine virtually immediately. And, and everyone knows, you know, if, if I am positive, I need to isolate, I need to wear a mask, I need to stay away from people. And I think all of those things are making a difference in, uh, you know, the COVID numbers that we're seeing. I want to ask uh, sort of two COVID questions. This one is from Christine. She says, and she writes the Kokua column, as you know, my understanding is that the Department of Health's broad wastewater surveillance system for COVID-19 won't be fully operational until the summer. Why has it taken so long to fully implement this early warning system? And, um, and how are you using that data once it is operational to influence the sort of mitigation protocols like adding a mask mandate back? I mean, what would be, what are the metrics? I know we've talked a lot about sort of what are the triggers? Are we not looking at case counts anymore? Are you looking at the wastewater? Are you looking at the hospitalizations? What what sort of goes into that decision-making process? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's uh, all of those things, uh, Yanji. You know, the, the wastewater, I wish we could uh, stand it up a lot quicker, but it, it um, we have to establish a whole new protocol of uh, taking samples of the wastewater, being able to uh, get the samples to a laboratory uh, that can test and fully sequence, you know, what they find in the wastewater in order for us to get a sense of um, whether COVID is. Um, and we know that there will be COVID in the samples, but um, to sequence them so we can identify which variants are present. So I think it all becomes part of that network of data that um, alerts us to what's happening. You know, if we are seeing, um, you know, increase uh, in uh, COVID in sewage in a community, that really allows us to put them on alert. We can encourage people to get uh, test themselves if they have the at-home test kits uh, and really allows us to focus a response in a way that we were not able to in the past. I want to move on. Uh, we have a number of topics that we want to discuss. So we want to move away from COVID and, and discuss where we're at with uh, some of the things that are happening within the legislature, specifically with what the lawmakers, uh, both the House Finance and the Ways and Means Committee in the Senate proposed and they announced on this show, in fact, uh, about a new plan moving forward. Of course, you had called for the legislature to release $100 of a sort of a tax rebate, if you will, for those residents. And those lawmakers announcing they're looking to expand that up to three hundred dollars. Uh, what are your thoughts on on their proposal moving forward? Yeah, Ryan, I think that's a great great news for our community. Um, I, when I proposed the one hundred dollar re rebate, it really was a recognition. I think that all of us have um, have worked through COVID and wanted a way to uh, support everyone. I do support targeted uh, relief for those who need it the most. And I you know, know that the Senate and the House is really looking at that. Um, Safe Travels Hawaii has allowed us to accelerate our recovery and we are seeing um, significant increases in the tax collections. Uh, and I do think that uh, we can afford uh, to provide a, a rebate to those most in need as well as to most in our community. You know, you had proposed at the start to put a billion dollars into the rainy day fund. The lawmakers say they want to put some money in there, but they're not going to reach that goal. What do you think is an adequate number? A billion obviously was ambitious, but what would you think be satisfactory for that for that fund? 
Yes, uh, Yanji, I think any any amount between uh, 500 million and a billion dollars would um, help us. Uh, you know, I um, do bond presentations to rating agencies twice a year, and I've um, um, been focused on assuring them that uh, we are looking uh, at the long haul. Uh, we do know that um, the significant funds provided by the American Rescue Plan by the Biden uh, administration has made a huge difference here in accelerating our re uh, recovery. But um, we also know that um, it's not a bottomless pit at the federal government. And should there be another surge, we might be uh, on our own. And that um, deposit into the rainy day fund just assures us that should we have another event like this COVID that dramatically uh, impacts our economy, uh, having the 700, uh, 700 million to a billion dollars would be sufficient for us to get through even the most severe kinds of economic turmoil. Another issue that continues to be debated over is the management of Mauna Kea and the role of the University of Hawaii in that we know that lawmakers are also discussing this uh, and trying to decide on a path forward for both the University of Hawaii and the future of astronomy and the programs that are happening there, specifically also as it regards to the 30 meter telescope. But what are your thoughts on the management of Mauna Kea and the University of Hawaii's role and how lawmakers right now are moving through that process? Yeah, certainly, Ryan. You know, uh, as you are aware, uh, in my 10-point plan that I announced back on, in 2015, you know, part of what we wanted to do is return to the uh, Department of Land and Natural Resources more than 10,000 acres from Mauna Kea uh, so that we could uh, better manage, we could set up a, a new uh, structure, um, expand uh, Native Hawaiian involvement uh, in um, management of most of the important uh, historic and cultural sites on Mauna Kea. Uh, and that way the university would be left with just the science district. Um, and, you know, I believe that um, all of us would like to see, or many of us in the community would like to see astronomy continue. Uh, there is broad support for the 30 meter telescope. Um, we all know that the university needs to do better and they are doing better in uh, recent audits. I want to move on to Red Hill. Uh, over, you know, we saw recently another spill at the facility, obviously not nearly as large as the one before, but certainly alarming to have any fuel uh, in that area going where it shouldn't, shouldn't be. How confident are you that the tanks can be safely drained? And what have your conversations been like uh, in recent weeks with the Navy? Yeah, just a couple of things that um, to note on that, Yanji. Uh, you know, because of uh, the Department of Health oversight, um, when they had uh, informed us that they had this um, routine maintenance procedure that they normally do and they would like to proceed with, uh, our Department of Health said, okay, let's go through the checklist. D do you have this in place? Are you prepared for this? Um, uh, are you ready? Should something go wrong and, uh, and there be a leak? Um, so um, that just goes to show that the, the Department of Health's regulatory um, role is important. It uh, reminded the Navy that they had to be prepared for a leak for every single action that is taken. Because of that, they were immediately aware that um, that fuel or water fuel mixture was leaking. Uh, and they had all of the materials necessary to capture it and absorb it uh, immediately. Uh, so, you know, I am confident if the Navy continues to work with um, us, with the Department of Health, uh, that we can safely defuel um, the, the storage tanks. Uh, you know, we look forward to the partnership. You know, we will make sure that we hold their feet to the fire. We're going to make sure that they take precautions uh, to limit the risk to the aquifer. Uh, and we um, continue to look forward to the day when the tanks are defueled safely uh, and um, we decommission the storage facility altogether. You know, in talking with Ernie Lau just a few weeks back, he explained just uh, how significant this problem is. And while this is a step in the right direction, there is still a lot of work that needs to be done 
uh, and just in the immediacy, the availability of just the overall water here for residents on the island of Oahu, especially as we head into the summer months, you know, asking for this voluntary cutback of 10%, which continues to be something that they uh, ask for, but may look to make something more mandatory as we head into those summer months. Uh, what are your thoughts about that mandatory or any sort of mandatory water restriction for residents on Oahu and how the state can p potentially help with managing some of that as we you know, head into this time where water will be very important? Well, just a couple of things, Ryan. You know, the state is one of the largest water users, and I did order all agencies to reduce water usage by 10 percent. You know, we want to lead by example uh, and make sure that we are managing our water use. Uh, you know, one of the things that, um, you know, we have uh, expressed to the Board of Water Supply is, you know, they have about 15 percent of the wells that are currently um, uh, down because of repairs or, or other activities. And, and if they were to focus on repairing uh, that 15 percent of the wells, it would restore more than the water that we've lost due to this Red Hill situation. So, I mean, I think it's a combination of, um, of both things, trying to uh, expand production out of existing wells, especially because uh, some of them are just down because of uh, equipment malfunctions. And, you know, once you fix the problem, we could get back into production right away. Uh, but we also need to work on future source development. And we are working with the um, Board of Water Supply uh, to see what we can do to help um, speed up the process. Uh, but we do want to do it in a safe way that doesn't put the aquifer in jeopardy. You know, there was a big article in yesterday's paper talking about the potential consequences of this to real estate development and housing. Uh, Stanford Carr was quoted saying that developers are worried about projects. They can't necessarily make plans if they don't know that the water is going to be there. Uh, Ernie Lau has said on this program that there might be some projects that don't get the meters that they need because they just don't have the water. Ed Case was on here to say that perhaps we should put prioritize some development over others, affordable over luxury and whatnot. What are your thoughts on that and how this could affect real estate development and long-term affordable housing in the state? Uh, absolutely, Yanji. We have been focused on the state level at affordable rentals, um, specifically because we know that um, every person in a rental is a resident. Um, but we need to prioritize. If we um, have scar a scarce resource, uh, then we ought to be thinking about uh, which projects deserve um, the ability to move forward. Uh, and we should place a priority on affordable projects. Uh, it just makes common sense. It's the projects that have the biggest impact for our residents. Uh, and clearly, that's the biggest need in our community, affordable housing, affordable rentals. And, and you know, you had mentioned that you're going to be holding the military accountable for this and, and through the actions in which to, to complete the actions that they say that they're going to be undertaking with this the feeling. Uh, how does that exactly look like? Is that through monthly meetings? Is that through the communication? Because, you know, again, when speaking with Ernie Lau and someone who has dealt with the military, oftentimes he says that uh, they say something and their actions reflect something different and that it's often delayed. How can the state do more to hold them accountable to ensure that this is done in the timetable that they presented? You know, I, Ryan, I would have to say this, you know, um, since um, we issued the emergency order to defuel and, um, you know, uh, evaluate the system, uh, the communications with the Navy and the Department of Defense has increased tremendously. You know, I've uh, in the last uh, several months had direct conversations with uh, Secretary Austin and uh, Secretary uh, Carlos Del Toro. Um, and uh, the leaders here uh, of the Navy, specifically about Red Hill. Um, so they are, there is increased uh, communications uh, between the state and the Navy. Uh, we continue to ask for improvements uh, in the responsiveness uh, and really uh, making sure that they uh, do treat us as a full partner. We're not there yet. But, um, you know, they are responding when we raise concerns. They are, are responding to, uh, to try and implement um, the changes that we're asking for because we believe it, it uh, will allow us 
to move forward in a safe way and defuel as quickly as possible. You know, you mentioned having state agencies reduce their water by 10%. What specific ways are they actually doing that? And what kind of a timetable did you give them in terms of actually adopting those practices? Well, Yanji, it's it's as simple as, you know, we do have like uh, an irrigation schedule where they are, you know, watering lawns and things like that. So we're asking every agency to look at whatever schedule that is. Uh, and reduce it by um, by 10%. So, you know, if they um, are watering, um, you know, every day, then it really is about uh, watering, you know, nine days out of 10 uh, or reducing the length of time. You know, all of those things uh, do have an impact on the, the water usage. Um, and, you know, the focus is to do whatever is necessary uh, to reduce uh, usage by 10%. We, of course, are going into the summer months, as we mentioned, that could impact this water supply, but also just the arrival of guests and tourists that are expected to come to the islands. Uh, you had mentioned that with safe travels, uh, you know, the, the lifting of that has also allowed for more people. We're seeing more money come into the state as well. Um, how are you anticipating the state will be able or, the, you know, to be able to accommodate this influx of visitors that are coming in, especially also with uh, the Asian market that is expected to also return. Do you feel that we are prepared and ready to take on uh, the influx of visitors that could be coming to our shores shortly? You know, one of the things that we've stressed, Ryan, and um, in our meeting with the Japan Association of Travel Agents, uh, we heard it back. So, you know, we have been stressing with all of our travel partners that we want to uh, manage the destination we want to be focused on attracting those visitors that would spend more. Uh, we want to be able to attract visitors that will work with us in our Malama Hawaii program to take care of our natural resources. Um, and um, the Japanese travel partners were very clear that they're committed to doing that. They are interested in, um, in producing uh, in-flight videos that can help tell that story. They are putting it through all of their uh, marketing um, materials as they begin to uh, invite visitors back. Uh, and we do believe that um, our efforts to restart the Japan travel will be um, mirrored and, and um, copied as we um, pursue South Korea and Australia and all the other uh, international um, points of origin. I know we're almost out of time, but I want to ask you, there's a number of questions in the comments about golf courses. Could you please ask about getting hotels to use gray water for golf courses? This, of course, is going back to the converse, uh, conservation idea. What about also for uh, public golf courses, those run you know, by, by the state or the county? What about using more gray water you know, throughout that system, not just for golf courses, but also for sports fields and parks and what have you? Is that part of the conversation? Is that something you'd support? Yeah, certainly I think, Yanji, we are looking at how we can um, be smart about our water use. Uh, we don't have a real good gray water distribution system at this point in time, but um, as we are renovating and making investments in state facilities, uh, we are looking at how we can maximize water reuse uh, within our facilities. Uh, so that's a, a great suggestion, and I think we fully embrace that. Um, as, as we make investments, as I said, we are looking at how we can incorporate that. Uh, you know, we don't have uh, an organized uh, gray water distribution system. Uh, so we would have to uh, capture that water uh, and make it available to the state facilities in, in order to increase gray water usage. You know, as we wrap up our time here, we just want to ask about your future. There's about eight months left uh, in your term as governor. You've been in this office now for eight years. Uh, what are your thoughts about moving forward for you personally beyond this office? I mean, do you have any other future plans or anything laid out in terms of what you would like to do next? You know, Ryan, I'm really focused on uh, finishing strong. There are a couple of things, you know, obviously housing and uh, dealing with homeless, homelessness continues to be a challenge for our community. Uh, and, you know, we will definitely be focused on uh, getting those projects in the pipeline uh, completed. 
uh, so that uh, we can make an impact uh, in the last eight months that we're here. Uh, you know, beyond that, I really haven't, um, you know, thought much about that. I know I'll be traveling uh, and certainly I probably will have um, an opportunity to attend more volleyball games. Uh, that match on Saturday, uh, although I couldn't make it to the arena, I uh, did have the opportunity to watch it. And, um, you know, we have another great uh, team. Um, you know, those things are, I think are important for all of us as we learn to live with COVID uh, to really uh, begin to uh, take the actions to keep ourselves and our community safe, uh, but at the same time, get back to normal, get back to doing the things that we enjoy doing, you know, going to sporting events, uh, hopefully graduations that will be back to normal uh, and really um, taking the precautions that's necessary to keep our community safe. I got to ask you because I ask everyone, are there any thoughts that you'd run for CD2 if Kaikahele vacates his seat? Uh, no, I'm not really interested in serving in the Congress. I mean, I think that that's a really important uh, responsibility. And, you know, I've had the privilege of working with our congressional delegation, and I do know that they work really hard. Uh, that's certainly not something that I aspire to. All right. Well, Governor Ige, thank you so much for starting your week off with us once again and answering our questions. Uh, we always uh, appreciate the time and I look forward to our next conversation. Thanks so much. Yeah. Aloha. Aloha. Thank you for being here. Well, you never know, Ryan, so we always got to ask, and I wasn't the only one. Heidi also had the same question. Uh, there's a lot of speculation as to what will happen with the congressman's seat and if he actually will pursue uh, you know, running for governor. But beyond that, uh, Governor Ige did address a number of issues responding at the top of this conversation to your question about perhaps reinstating the mask mandate uh, like the city of Philadelphia has now announced that they are doing because they're seeing a rise in cases. He says that's not part of uh, his calculation at the moment, but he does advocate keeping masks in schools uh, for the time being. Yeah, you know, you heard from him saying that he knows that some people may have been uh, critical of his decision to extend uh, the mask mandate for as long as he did, uh, but said that he didn't want it to be a situation where he would uh, reinstate the mask mandate, then lift the mask mandate and go back and forth saying that it just would not be uh, conducive to anyone or, or the businesses and anyone that ha would have to enforce that. And so he is confident in the situation that the state has set up and the way that they are preparing for any new surge. It is not necessarily saying that that is not on the table. There could be a time where he will have to reinstate the mask mandate. But at this point in time, he says that the state is in a good po uh, position. He also noted that about 40 percent of the cases that we're seeing now are that of that new uh, Omicron variant. And so, uh, you know, we continue to, as he said, monitor the situation. But right now feels that the state is in a good position. Yeah, thankfully, hospitalizations are down. And while cases could go up, at least at this point, it does appear that people are being or, you know, are able to recover rather quickly. So that's good news there. He also responded to uh, the legislature taking up the idea of giving people not the $100 uh, tax credit that he had suggested at the start of the session, but actually increasing that to up to $300 for those earning less than $100,000 a year. That's something he says he supports. Also, he talked about the rainy day fund. In his mind, a good target is between between 500 million and a billion dollars to put into that fund so that if there is another COVID situation or who knows what else comes our way that we would be able to handle it. Yeah, and he also is on the topic of Red Hills is that he has asked state departments to cut back their water usage by 10%, uh, everything from just simple ways in which each department uses the water to the way in which irrigation is used around buildings and such, uh, saying that the state needs to lead by example in this effort for the voluntary 10% uh, reduction of water, knowing, noting that also the department, uh, excuse me, the Board of Water Supply, uh, encouraging them to fix some of those 15% of the wells that are currently not operational because of maintenance problems and things that are going on there. Uh, he's saying that he encourages the Board of Water Supply to fix some of those uh, issues to help fulfill some of the water that was lost because of what is happening at Red Hill. 
Yeah, that was interesting. I have not heard anyone in power talk about or in leadership talk about that issue. And he's saying that if those wells were fixed, they could actually make up for the water that we've lost uh, because the halava shaft is not available right now. So that was a very interesting thing to note. Uh, the next time Ernie Lau's on this program, we will ask him about that and if that water would be adequate to replace what is lost at the moment. Uh, there were a number of comments in there about uh, that we didn't get to ask the governor about regarding crime. And we are going to be talking about that. That with our guest on Wednesday. That's right. We're going to be talking to uh, Prosecutor Steve Alm, who is going to be joining the program to talk about some of the things that are happening within our community. Uh, we know that there are some high profile cases that continue to uh, be making headlines here in the state, as well as some of the issues that continue to happen with um, crimes that are happening in Waikiki and in downtown, getting his thoughts on where we're at with some of the prosecution and also following up on some of the things that we talked to about uh, with Shopo and things that are happening and concerning the Honolulu Police Department and some of the barriers that they feel that they are running into when it comes to the enforcement of some of the laws that they are trying to uphold. So a lot to talk to and get to with Om um, on Wednesday. We hope to see you right back there. Until then, stay safe and have a great week. Aloha. Aloha. This episode of Spotlight Hawaii is brought to you by Long's Drugs.